hey hey so this is sarab uh, you know i'm your host for living port which is a podcast talking about global mobility international recruitment and especially global student housing and look today who we got you got should i call it father of student housing in us oh, no no uh, if not <laughs> yeah, no definitely not no if not father surely one of the thought leader in student housing globally especially in us and it's my privilege and pleasure to interact with none other wisdies you know who is a producer and a host for student housing side that then me to talking i would love you to introduce yourself and yeah, let's get sure sure no great to be here today uh, of course you know we've known each other for a couple of years now so good to uh, get to sit down and and interact um i'm glad you were able to do this during my business day <laughs> as opposed to to your business hours since we're uh, you know on opposite sides of the of the earth but um yeah so Wesley D CEO of Student Housing Insight um uh, also have a consulting company called Providential Student Housing I've been in the industry for going on 27 years just over 27 years now and you know started while I was in college you know picking up a, a part-time leasing gig and um uh, with a brand new development and I, yeah I was in school to become a teacher and quickly realized that's not what I wanted to do and um I actually got out of student housing after graduation and missed it so much 2 years later I, I jumped right back into it so that's uh that's Yeah, that's that's the very abbreviated version of it. It's so. amazing. Did I did I heard it right? You said 27 years, 27 27 years in this. 27. Industry. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I was I'm a I'm a Gen Xer. I was in college in the yeah, you know, latter part of the 90s, so so yeah, I'm I'm all of a sudden the the old man in the room. <laughs> uh definitely not. At least your energy and your mind is really still very young you know and i can as i mentioned you know you also looking and getting sharper you know uh, so when you mentioned 27 years and you know that means late 90s you know it's it's 2024 27 years what has changed when you were fresh out of college you started your leasing gig since then now you know if you can go through the journey for yourself and for the student housing industry as a whole you know when i got involved with it you know if you, if you look at the if you look at the us and and what's happened as far as the uh the history of purpose built student housing um in the late 70s um you had a you had a a group that was um based out of tennessee that was um which is now has now all been swept up under graystar but they were really focused in on um helping universities out that needed more housing um and and they came in and did it you know as a completely privatized um venture but it was very much taking that on campus model of a dorm food services and everything else and um and building that out and they came up with the first the first uh individual bedroom lease and and started that you know by the bed model and then you know fast forward to um you know to the to the early 90s you started seeing this um you started seeing a lot of folks that had experience on the apartment side and it was typically you know more of the the garden home developer that said hey we we've already got this multifamily model we can change some things up and and you know it can really speak to a lot of a lot of what the university <laughs> students in this country were looking for which for the most part was private bedroom private bath shared common areas amenities that were geared towards students and so that was kind of the time frame I started coming into it you know in the in the mid not mid 90s late 90s and um uh, it was originally on the you know it was on the the actual ownership side of it <clears throat> there was a group of developers that were doing what we call kitty condos 
it was that you know it was that format of what you know what we see with um the, the garden style home but instead of renting them all out they they actually sold them off as condos and they marketed it in a in a sense where you had um you know a student was kind of the main person that you were going after they were going to be the purchaser of it so you're talking about you know uh, you know mostly junior seniors grad students for the most part and they would actually market to the parents directly with direct mail and it was more of a a, a situation of it wasn't it was more on the investment side versus you know anything that had to do with you know a luxurious place for your son or daughter to live it was about cutting out the most expensive part of college which is the housing part of it so they constructed these typically in a four bedroom four bath and interest rates were at a point at that at that time where you could um in a lot of these markets you could come in buy a four bedroom four bath um, model the student would typically qualify for a um uh, first time home buyers mortgage so ultra low interest rates the parents were the co-signers on it and you know the objective was to rent the three other rooms out to their friends and therefore cover the mortgage now you've cut out the biggest expense of college which is that housing part and um some things changed in uh let's call it 2000 2001 ish where um uh, hud in this country was no longer going to allow for that to to happen because they said yeah it was a first time home buyers you know that was completely legit but when they would end up graduating you know they he would move out and so um and it became investment property so um they just basically said hey no longer will we you know put financing for these where you've got bedroom bath parity above three bedrooms and so that made it a little harder to do that and all of those developers then focused on okay well we'll just we'll just you know do this as a bill to rent and um and then that's when things just really kind of exploded with the with the development you also had after i left college you had the millennials that were coming in um you know which was a big baby baby boom here in the states and um it was important for for all of those parents to make sure that their kids went to college and so we saw a huge explosion with enrollment and along with that we saw a lot of explosion with with this purpose-built student housing development um you know very early on you know i remember having to go with the developer that i worked with you know to the banks and walk through this story of you know because all they could think of in their head was you know the movie uh, animal house <laughs> and how that was you know how that was going to end up um you know how that was going to end up working out as as investment real estate and they just they couldn't really get their their heads around it and so well you know what happens if if students don't want to live there and you know it was a it was a simple pivot of well now you've got a multifamily property that yeah you, know, you can you can market and so it, it was it was strange it's it's very much like what i saw co-living you know five six seven years ago where the banks just didn't want to touch it it was very similar to that and um and, you know and now they've gotten comfortable with that and uh, you know purpose-built student housing is you know really kind of been the um the recession proof um asset class that that is the darling of the multifamily real estate industry so hopefully that answers your question on that i mean it's so broad that you know i am happy to listen for another hour but you know just to ensure that you know you you are on track and you're on your board so so what is how do you describe the current pbsh market in europe versus 2000 2005 2010 from the current last two years so i did you say europe sir bob or did you say the current uh you know market in us was oh, in US. happening europe and asia 
But let's focus. Oh, on compared to what's happening there. Okay, gotcha. I've I haven't spent a lot of time in Europe. I've spent a lot of time, um, or a good decent amount of time, evaluating um, the UK and and spent some time there touring a lot of different properties. Um, spent a lot of time in Canada as well as in in South America, um, and as even you know, I've consulted on some stuff in Africa. Um, Asia haven't been really involved with. Um, Australia is a we can talk about that too, but I would say, you know, comparing specifically the U S to, to the, you know, the UK and, and to Europe. Um, the one thing that really surprised me in with my time in Europe and, and, you know, visiting those communities, especially in the cities is how centralized everything was. And I came back from, um, for my first visit to, uh, to London for, for work and was really kind of shocked at how um, how well they were doing everything from a centralization standpoint. Um, you know, having these internet marketing <laughs> listing services. You know, we've got ILSs here, but it's a subscription model. It's not a you know, it's not commission based, and so it's very very different from that standpoint. And yeah, I was just amazed at how centralized everything was. And that was, um, you know, kind of leaning on my friends and colleagues within the, within the industry. I said, I think there's a better way of doing this, but, um, you know, every, everyone just kind of pushed it off and said, that'll never work with our domestic students here. We've got too many, you know, we have to roll out the red carpet for them. It's just not going to work. And, um, it's amazing to see what happened after the pandemic when they were forced to centralize. And yeah, you know, the pandemic's done. It's over. <laughs> and for the past three, you know, three cycles, especially the past two cycles, um, you know, they're not they're not going back. Um, now That's it's cool. you know it's again it's not centralized, but it's it, it is. You get more economy of scale. You know, it's uh, you know you have better control, better track of you know uh, things. But please, over to you. And when was this? When did you go to London first time? Once it was in 2018. Right. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, it, it, yeah, it's it's been amazing to kind of see see that. Of course, you know AI has been, um, especially over the past year, has has really um, taken a lot of the lift off of what you know operators were concerned about. Um, so I think that has certainly helped, and we'll we'll you know we'll see how that continues. But U.S. operators feel like it's got to be very hot touch, and it does. I mean, don't, don't get me wrong. I, you know, <laughs> I've served this, this student profile for, you know, almost three decades now. I know how hot touch it is. And, um, but I do think that, um, as much as we think that the students want hot touch, they want it from a technology standpoint. So, so you talk about technology, you talk about AI, of course, you know, uh, there are lots of been changing in us, in Europe, you know, in the emerging markets in Australia, as well as Dubai, Singapore. But when we deal with students, you know, and dealing with parents, you know, yes, technology is amazing, but how much technology one should introduce in something which is physical, you know, it's a living experience, right? Students mm -hmm. spending bomb and they need human touch. Do you think too much technology is good for this sector or one needs to have balance between human and technology? Yeah. Yeah. No, I always question how much technology um, is is good for this. Not just from the standpoint of, you know, I'm an operator at heart, and you know, that's that's where my mind lives all the time. But I've also got four children. You know, my oldest is a is a Gen Z, and then I've got three Gen Alpha. <laughs> so they've got technology all the time and there's a lot of things that i've seen you know i've seen that calls because you, you go through those periods of time where you take the devices away and it, you know it's it's like dealing with a alcoholic at some some points where it's they're mad and crazy but once it's gone for a couple of days it's the wiring becomes different in their head at that point and um, you know, they, they get along better with each other and everything else. And so th there's parts of that, that I think where things are, are headed 
globally, as far as mental health is concerned, you know, we're seeing a lot of onboarding of this technology is, is causing a lot of those issues. So I hope that we come out of that, but let's, you know, let, let's talk about it from an operation standpoint. Um, I talk to operators every single day and what I'm doing. And the thing is, I'm, I'm really asking them a lot of questions around how student housing insight and how myself as a consultant can better help them. And the thing I keep hearing over and over again is our tech stack is just ridiculous. And I've got all these vendors and everything that are bringing, you know, more solutions and better solutions. And we spend more time evaluating software than we actually do using it. So, you know, we saw this with, um, certainly with web 2.0, right? And, um, and, and so we're kind of going through that again. We'll see who some of the winners and losers are of that. Um, that's always kind of fun to look at, you know, in retrospect. Um, but we are definitely in that point right now, especially in prop tech and fintech where there's, there's more being thrown at us than we can honestly handle from that standpoint. So, and everything's got a little bit of a, you know, different innovation, a little bit of, of a different tweak that works. But I think more than anything, what's not going to work is a group that is <clears throat> any type of technology company or startup or um, whatever that's not going to be focused on what we are focused on, which is the residents. You know, they can come out with something that, that works for not just the operators, but for the investment guys. But if, if any part of that touches the residents' eyeballs and it's not thinking about them, and how they're viewing things and how they're interacting with things and what kind of value it brings them, those groups are going to end up being the ones that fail, in my opinion. So, No, I agree. I agree. In fact, you know, let me share my experience. So I have, a, I also have a four year daughter, you know, who I call a, my AI version, you know, uh, I mean, they are born smart because they're born with a smartphone, yeah. right? But as a parents and also someone who's into student housing and into international edu education for a while, I believe mean, it's very important for parents and the ecosystem to balance out technology with human touch because now everyone, everyone got very high IQ and more importantly, mm. IQ. you know, so at least in UK and in, in few parts of the globe, there are lots of open areas, there are lots of community, there are lots of, you know, uh, sports rooms and all. There were time when these were frills, then there are time that these, these are mandatory. Right, yeah. but now we are questioning that whether we need a cinema hall wherein only two or four people are watching it, or should we have a more open area, you know, wherein probably they can interact because it's not about IQ, you know, it's about EQ or SQ, you know, social quotient, you know, because people yeah. are on their phones, you know, and they are chatting with their people sitting next rather than talking, right? Yeah. Now coming on your point on, you know, from a if you see from an operator point of view. And especially all the technology and integrations happening. So we have been a listing platform, then we move a marketplace. Now we are a managed marketplace, but all this, what we realized that technology needs to be enabler, right? But it's very hard for people to adopt it. It's easier to build. You know, when I yeah. created my own uh, property management solution, we thought it would be a cakewalk, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. solution, it's a cheapest solution, you know, but what I realized People like the product, they got the demo, they got overwhelmed, but, and we were pitching the right people, but it's that change management, you know, because yeah. the way this industry moves it's so fast, you know, you're completing the intake and you are starting off the next intake. So change management is the biggest thing, which I realized in adopting technology, as you mentioned, you know, people, if people are exploring, but probably not using, and they're still sticking with the same solution or probably a better version, a, a bit better version of solution, right? So keeping that technology and balancing out, you, you touch upon web two and web three. Do you think web three, any provider or any, uh, uh, you know, accommodation partner across is actually using web three, which is more virtual, which is more engaging, right? Rather than just. Yeah. Talking. You have to, yeah. I want to make sure we define web three because yeah, yeah. web three kind of means different things to That's different thing. people. So. <laughs> I mean, for, for Gen Z, probably uh, it, it's it's crypto. For us, it's probably virtual. Are people actually using Web3? Or this is a marketing gimmick key or, you know, because this is a new thing in, you know, people are talking about Web3, but 
how are people using Web3 in the current scheme of things? Specifically with our customers or with the operators? Any part, you know, any part of the system. You know, with with students, I mean, it just, it, it all comes as far as from a marketing and leasing standpoint, you know, and if you bring in social media and everything else, you know, into under that umbrella as well, man, there's some really great folks out there that I'd love for you to ask that question to because they would be so much better. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'd love to hear what what they have to say from that standpoint, as far as from a from a customer standpoint, and on a, and, and from a specifically marketing and advertising and leasing, you know, with our students. Let me kind of focus a bit more on the um, you know where things seem to be headed from from an operation standpoint with it. It is very very heavy on the data analytics side of it, and being able to get more and more info as quick as we can and not just the info but being able to provide the insights stuff that i'm seeing now and you know again most of this is i wouldn't call it web 3.0 it's more ai um, driven being able to get the data that we've always either been able to get or we've been searching and mining for you know within operations being able to um now get that and be able to analyze it you know within seconds as to here's what your residents are saying be it by analyzing google reviews or what, whatever which is something that was very labor intensive you know five years ago and it's now something that i do on a daily basis market by market and it's just you know basically saying i want to look at these these properties go analyze these google <coughs> review pages our business pages and you know within within minutes you know we've got an analysis and, and can kind of see you know we see within minutes you know, okay forget where things are at with pre-leasing and with with um uh, with rates now i'm able to see what's actually happening with the re you know with the residents and their perception and that is really really strong that type of quick insight seems to be you know, manifesting itself on all kinds of levels. Uh, I'm excited about this conference that you, that you and I are headed to in Vegas next week, because there's a lot of companies that are been coming out with some new things in the past few weeks that I'm really interested in, in getting everybody's feedback on. So anyway, I, that, I don't think that necessarily answered your question, but it's, that's... It's a candid chat. You know, it's not a question answer, it's a candid chat. So it's two friends talking and probably picking each other's brains. Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about US as a market, you know, uh, because you are a, you are a, actually a bigger expert on US as a market, you know, uh, where we are coming in, we see globally, you know. So when I compare US with UK, I say for me, UK is a more mature market when it comes to uh, using platforms, probably, you know, attracting international students. But as we mm -hmm. all know, you know, US has been very aggressive to attract international students, especially from a PBSA side of it, because I mean, I have not seen U.S. universities being so aggressive, looking to hire Chinese and Indian Indian students and Asian students. Because what I what I read, you know, the domestic market, which used to be ninety five percent, you know, that ninety five percent is shrinking. You know, uh, bets are getting a bit less affordable for local students, especially mm -hmm. in PPSH. You know, yeah. So, what's yeah. your take on that? You know, why that's happening? You know, in the first place, and then how, how you know. That inflection point in US as a market for adopting marketplaces and attracting more international students versus focusing on more domestic students. You know, we we've the US has led the, the world in international recruitment. I shouldn't say in recruitment, but in attracting. Um, I think the UK has done a much better job of hitting the ground and yeah, yeah. working with the working with the agencies and everything else to to bring those students there. But as far as attracting international students, this is this has been the mecca, right? And um, <clears throat> for years, and yeah, you know, th there's been some things from you know a political standpoint that we're going through as a country that I think has certainly made students think about okay, is that is that really where, where I want to go? You know, and I would say for the most part, when you're talking about the universities, like they're they're the last ones that you've got to to worry about. Uh, you know, as far as making some kind of drastic change. But man, when I was in Canada, probably I think it was the summer of 2017. You know, and there was 
some political stuff that was happening with, um, you know, one of it was a prince of the of Saudi Arabia or something. I, I can't even remember what the issue was, quite honestly. But there was there was an ambassador from Canada to Saudi Arabia that made a remark, and they pulled the ambassador out of Canada, and then told all of their students to come home that summer that they were they or they could stay, but you know, they were no longer going to be providing financial support and couldn't guarantee them that they could come back, you know, into the country um, at a later date. And so that changed some things for, for my thinking about, you know, what type of, you know, all these ge geopolitical type of things that really have an impact on on recruiting those students and attracting those students. And so, uh, so that, that's been interesting to see. And I think we've, um, we have certainly suffered um, and the pandemic certainly didn't help as well. And we're still rebounding from, you know, from that. And talk about, you know, the geopolitical part of it. You know, I think it was this past year. I think it was the year before. I believe it was this past year. Things switched from, you know, we primarily were importing, if that's the word that you want to use. The biggest number of students were coming from China. It's now India. What is different, you know, with that, um, that a lot of operators are trying to get their, not necessarily get their head around, but some of these properties that are these bigger universities that are pedestrian to campus, <clears throat> that are newer, that really kind of relied on, on a lot of those Chinese students are not marketable to Indian students coming. They're looking for something way more affordable and that ends up, you know, pushing them a further distance out from campus where they've got to rely on either public transportation or their own vehicle or whatever. That's something that I spent a lot of time talking to university administrators as well, that over the past couple of years, that's become significant um, and an issue that they're hearing more and more about because um, a lot of those students that they're not able to, uh, because they, you know, their priorities go to their freshman students. And a lot of these students are, <clears throat> that are coming from some of these other countries um, you know, are not coming in as a true freshman. And, um, and so they've, they've got to look for off campus housing. Um, and that's just, that's becoming more and more tough. So that's something that we've got to get, we got to, we got to create some solutions to, we've got to, um, you know, and I think this is where, you know, a company like yourself really can help out and not just attracting those students, but also giving some guidance to operators, you know, what the expectations need to be for these students, rental budget and that type of thing. In fact, exactly. You know, my next question was, you know, and it seems that you have planted for me, but why were or still lots of accommodation partners are reluctant to work with marketplace? And even if they're working, they're working in a very, very limited portfolio for limited reasons versus if you compare Australia or UK, you know, it's very centralized, as you mentioned, due to which it's easy adoption, you know, and they're more open. They, they give the full portfolio right away. Not to all. There's a lots of due diligence and, you know, gone are the days when any marketplace can mushroom because now there's consolidation in marketplaces also. But why was there or still there a bit reluctance of US as a uh, economy from mark from, from student housing side of it to go all in and adopt because as you mentioned, most of the local ILFS are subscription based. Here in yeah. most of them are performance based. You know, so it's an for me at least, I believe it's a no-brainer, wherein you're not spending a dime till the time you're getting a confirmed student. So yeah. what is that reluctancy? Why? I mean, you've been talking to everyone. Yeah. I think the biggest thing is look, you've got a um you've got an infrastructure of people who have been you know, because this the industry here is much more mature, somewhat sophisticated than you see in other countries. And a lot of that has been on the marketing and leasing side, a lot of it on the marketing side. So you've got this infrastructure of regional marketing people, director of marketing people that, you know, are talking about giving away, you know, somewhere in between <clears throat> half a month to a month's worth of, or, you know, one installment. That's, it's a term lease typically for a year divided into 12 installments and you know so you're talking six to eight percent you know of of that revenue that um a lot of the marketplaces are you know initially coming in and saying 
oh yeah we can at least you know and this is what you know it's not gonna cost you anything but we you know take it on from a performance standpoint it is just so foreign to them i mean to me it makes all the sense in the world hey i'm only paying for you know the the folks that um, but i guess that's where that's where you know i you got it right i'm sorry interrupting between you know? yeah 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 i guess that's where the the perception is to change i don't know who is charging 16 percent or half a month because the average at least we are charging four to eight percent five to six percent average in fact i did the yeah, math five to six, that's what that's what we're, yeah that's what we're talking about yeah yeah okay i heard 16 percent right uh and i like who is paying 16 well, no i said i said six, I to, not eight, with them. six, six <laughs> to eight percent six to eight percent is what i said yeah yeah i thought 16 and why we are not working with them who are they yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. yeah yeah six to eight percent is typically what they're paying or what you know what the terms are um and i've seen you know a lot of folks that you know have tried to establish a footprint here of you know they're doing it for less some of these other markets that are pretty big like a you know austin texas or a tallahassee florida a lot of these marketplaces have you know driven the ppc up so much that you know if someone you know to go out and and you know get the word west campus which is huge and when you're talking about searches in in austin texas that number's going up significantly since a lot of the marketplaces have tried to establish a footprint here um and and garner domestic students so there's a little bit of uh attitude there i guess is the best of putting of you know these guys are killing me on ppc and you know we're actually you know, in a lot of cases they're actually a partner I guess um, I guess that's a lack of communication between you know because with UK and Australia as a see what we see ourselves as a partner because it's very simple right for us also our low hanging fruits are international students right versus domestic domestic generally we attract through organic you know through rebooking referrals I believe it's high time that there's a communication you know because in UK Australia there are lots of communication conferences happening association happening between marketplace and providers because absolutely you, you got it right you know eventually it's partners you know and if, if partners are growing you know and we are cutting on their marketing expenses no one will thrive right so it's yeah. a, it's a you know you're doing a great job by communicating that it's just not six to eight person and eating on their ppcs but it's about probably domestic students we are attracting through organic and also see it has to be more strategic and more long-term way uh the play which happened in uk and australia wherein it's just not that we are filling their bets. You know, it's also about how we are taking their names to a new markets, whether it's Nigeria, whether it's Dubai, whether it's Southeast Asia, wherein they are not marketing any which ways. And and people who have started, you know, I mean, I can name few asset living and few, you know, Sian. They already have a heads up compared to even the biggest brands in US because they've been a bit conservative. They've been focusing only on long term, uh, only on uh, domestic students. So it's changing. It's changing all. I mean, Credit to you guys, credit to few of our team members and other marketplaces wherein the right narrative and communication start happening, but still long way to go. Over to you. Yeah, no, I think that's I think that's the biggest um pushback that the marketplaces are getting in this country is again the the folks that are a part of these director of marketing positions and you know with these operating firms. This isn't what anything that they've had to rely on in the past. They do understand it from a standpoint of being able to feed more international students, you know, to the properties. And they know that if they can get in front of more international students long before they come here, that they're going to get more of them. But, you know, like I said, especially when it comes to, to domestic students, they want to get very adversary <laughs> when it comes to that. Cause they've, yeah, they, they worked hard on their marketing plans and, you know, if um, what's what's the average that you guys are doing now in the, in the UK as far as filling up purpose built or PBSA twenty yeah. percent maybe? I believe it's 30, 35 percent. You know, because 30, around 35? around twenty five, thirty percent goes to university directly. Around twenty, thirty percent people are filling it directly all rebooking among three four of us 30 35 percent even in few markets 40 50 percent also let's say example let's take example of coventry you know it's a very international market in uk mm -hmm. right people have they are oversupplied because you know they all got the license at the same time and they start developing and that's the beauty of pbsa you know there's one city which is under supply for three years 
and then everyone gets there and then get oversupplied and then everyone l- big loves market pricing and we become the blue star and they're ready to pay mm-hmm. person my my request and suggestion to everyone always that don't see market pricing like a short term genie you know that you will throw money and we will produce the result oh, yeah, 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 yeah 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 among market places <laughs> in uk australia it's uk alan australia and even in new emerging markets like italy spain camp uh, uh, you know france anywhere from 25 to 40 percent average of 30 35 percent gotcha okay yeah so what do you think how much is been done by market pricing in you <clears throat> as for you Well, I don't I don't know what the number would actually be on that. I, and I know you and a couple of other marketplaces are about to release some reports that might be able to shine a little bit of a light on that, but I will tell you what the folks um you know the again those directors of of marketing with those firms you know have told me of look if we get to you know more than more than 3 to to 5% coming from marketplaces we've got to completely change our marketing plan and that means things that we know are working you know, we're going to have to cut from that and you know that's just a it, it ends up becoming a gamble of you know how much do we want to to give away because a lot of the folks that they use you know on campus and and in their offices for for marketing and leasing They're mostly co- college students. You start getting above three to five percent that are coming from marketplace from these marketplaces. You're going to have to start cutting back some of that overhead. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? You know, the thing is, is those those same students do a lot of things from a resident retention standpoint and an administrative standpoint. That when they start thinking about having to lose those people, it's you know it, See, it again, hurts. Again, this is another myth. You know, I would say. we are not <clears throat> we work with lots of universities also you know we are on lots of university websites you know as a alternate accommodation it took us some time to convince the universities and their accommodation uh, teams that we are not going after your jobs or competing with you in fact we are alternative mm-hmm. right and we can all coexist and it's happening in uk it's happening in australia it's happening in ireland even in canada is coming well you know if i compare to us because we are not after those jobs because in fact i was about to ask What do you think? How much it costs for for a community or a site to acquire domestic students, international students, and you know offline or was it digital outreach? Any any thoughts around that? Any numbers around that? Give you some ideas on what you know marketing expense. You know what percentage of you know a property's budget is going towards towards marketing expenses? And you know you're talking anywhere from on a new dev. you know it, that's obviously really high they want to keep that if you're including overhead in it as well 30% yeah that so when you start talking about you know 6 to 8% of of revenue if a marketplace was to fill everything up you know some of the some of those expenses on the marketing side have got to change we can't have we can't have expenses going from you know 30% to 38% the right way is and what we have seen is working that rather than switching off only giving hard sell not giving easy sell or probably you know a more popular one if mm-hmm. they have a cap let's say okay if 3 to 5 percent comes from marketplace can we take it to 15 percent and give a stipulated budgets or numbers and targets mm-hmm. uh, basically to diversify their student base let's say you know we've been working with partners who have given us some targets to get in students from india china south asia europe right and they have given the full portfolio and they have given us okay this is the maximum budget we can give it to you you know you can use it for mm-hmm. marketing you can use it for ppcs you can use it for you know offline online events in destination in in sourcing markets see for for partners it's a very heavy operational business you know and it's not just leasing right they need to focus more on catering the existing students while they are acquiring new students right mm-hmm. So for a property manager, if they know that okay, fifteen twenty percent of their business is will taken by someone who they have giving a stipulated budgets, which is not exceeding their budgets and their mm-hmm. markets, it works. You know, I guess you know discussion like this, you know, conference like NHMCs, definitely adding lots of value for the ecosystem because then people are talking. You know, because mm-hmm. the market place model for US was not it, it wasn't new, but it wasn't very open. now in last 3 4 years we started opening and it's a it's a inflection point wherein 
more international students are choosing uh, US. They are choosing more PBSH, right? Even yeah. PBSH has realized that they need to, you know, they can't just rely on domestic students. You know, yeah. if they yeah, they need to do marketing or set offices in sourcing markets, it will definitely be more hard work and even more experiment and and higher cost of acquisition versus focusing on their core and let see it's it's coexist it's, it's not one or two it has to be coexist coming back to my question again what it costs for a for a site to acquire a domestic student offline and versus digital versus marketplaces marketplaces we know you know is six to eight or four to eight person but what it how much it costs for a property manager to acquire domestic students to acquire one domestic student what's the what's the capture yeah no one knows that no one knows that an the answer to that question I mean, I, we're asking that constantly of, you know, folks that I talk with on, you know, shop talk on a, on a monthly basis, which is our monthly webinar. No one, no one knows the answer to that. I mean, they can take a look at it at the end of the year and say, okay, we spent this and we got to here. And, and this number was from specifically from, um, you know, we're new residents versus, you know, uh, a renewal or a rebooking is <clears throat> I think you guys refer to it as so yeah no one knows that I mean there's a couple of really good companies that uh, conversion logics I think is one G5 with real page that are trying to to tie all of that together and be able to show what that acquisition cost is but to everything I've seen today it's it's no yeah. one really 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 knows I have some numbers but I'll, I'll leave it to meet in person with chair so <laughs> uh, so I don't want to make it a, you know, hard sell marketplace uh, discussion, you know, uh, we can do in person, but as for you, you know, what are the biggest opportunities for developers, for facility managers in PBSH in US, and then we move to what are the biggest challenges they are battling with. Let's talk about opportunities first. So say that, say that again, cause you, I think you use the word facility managers and that, that means, that means something a little bit different or may mean something a little bit different for, for here. So ask that question one more time. So yeah, so in US, in US, Australia, uh, there is developer own and they manage. Then there are, uh -huh. you know, REITs, then there are developers, and then there are facility management companies, like CRM, stu, uh, no, uh, probably home for students, you know, versus let's say a great star model. They develop, they manage, and they also operate for other developers. Mm -hmm. so, so I would say, as a developer, what are the biggest challenges? As a operator, what are the biggest challenges in PBSH in US? So for development right now, it's just the ability to find deals that will pencil. Um, a lot of that you know, obviously just comes down to the economics, but the other thing that we have you know, seen post pandemic, that was, it's also just part of the fact we've got a failing birth rate here in the, in the U.S. and uh, and have for some time, and that's now coming to fruition with Gen Z. And you know, we've we've been talking about this enrollment cliff that's supposed to be coming here in the next year. And COVID was everybody in the higher ed world was kind of pointing to COVID as to being something that was going to be you know was going to accelerate that. You know, you wouldn't see that by looking at any of the you know tier one you know, flagship universities that are in this country, because what they did, the majority of them was students that they typically would not accept. They're now accepting them. So there's this whole flight to quality that has happened. So your bigger universities that already have pretty well established, you know, PBSH, PBSH market, you all of a sudden started finding developers going there and trying to find, you know, th there's not a lot of places where you can end up doing you know, thousand bed properties, it, you're talking about something that's going to be infill, typically less than 500 beds. It's, it's really hard to pencil those numbers, especially with where interest rates have been for the past two years. Um, we had a major cut here a week or so ago. I don't know if that's going to help anything on the development side just yet, but I think that will, will come back, but gone are the days where developers could go to any, you know, tier two school a mile from campus and throw up 500 to 700 beds and it work. I mean, I, that's, just, that's just not gonna work anymore. 
will it come back? I, I don't know. There's going to have to be some big demographic things that change for something like that. So, so are you seeing uh, US developers going out from US and probably moving to Europe or new emerging markets? There are some, and you know, I'm sure you're familiar with them. Pre-pandemic, I really liked some of the things I was seeing in South America. So, so that maybe, is mainly Brazil or any other markets. Uh, Brazil, um, Colombia. Colombia was was definitely one. In fact, I, I would actually say their response to COVID probably has helped them more than anything because they didn't, you know, lock everything down like we did. <clears throat> you know, when especially when you're an international student looking to go somewhere and you're like, well. You know, my my cousin went to the to the U.S. and couldn't get back out or couldn't get in because of X Y Z. You know, but uh, you know, Colombia didn't didn't have that problem. That's going to end up attracting more. Yeah, you know, and I'm I'm interested in seeing what's happening in Africa. Like I've mentioned earlier, there's been a couple of things I've done some remote consulting on, and there's some things that are interesting there. We'll we'll see what happens, but um, I I don't. There are a couple of firms that are especially on the equity, you know, the folks that are bringing their own equity in that certainly have their eyes on it. And, and, and um, interestingly, those couple are going to UK. I thought probably they will go to more emerging market in Europe. You know, I was, I was chit chatting with both, both of them, I would say. And I realized that probably it's a more safe heavens. UK is more established, more structured, you know, so mm -hmm. people are going to UK and taking a gateway to Europe through UK because probably it's more established, a bit less experimental. The asset class has been adopted. You know, there are equity coming in. Government support is there. You know, and from yeah. there, probably they are looking to Spain or probably Germany or Italy. Yeah, over to you. Yeah. So the a lot of the equity groups have gotten comfortable with you know PBSH in the U.S. Um, they they've got an interest in PBSA in in Europe and elsewhere. The developers actually picking up and you know doing developments elsewhere. We'll see. I mean, there was some, there was a big failure that happened about a decade ago um, with a developer that went to Canada, and a lot of a lot of folks really learned out learned how hard that you know was going to be. What what happened? And, uh, Without naming the developer, I don't want to get into I don't want to get into details, but it was a it was a very large property that was being built in Montreal, and um, it ended up. I would say it ended up collapsing that company. Um, I don't know all the details around it, but like I said, everybody everybody understood after that how hard it was to to go to another country and and try to do the same thing. So you, you, you mentioned anyway. equity, equity players are already comfortable with PBSH in US. Uh, what they look for? Why? I mean, you and me understand, but there are lots of uh, audience which are probably new to PBSH. You know, we have a, have a large audience base which is probably universities vice chancellors recruitment agents they are university reps and there are also lots of investors you know who've been holding money in india and they want to invest abroad especially in this asset class and also they have invested in india but but we come to you know what's your view on india if any and then probably i probably probably i add to that but why pbsh been darling to most of the equity players and investors you know, apart uh -huh. from, you know, we all know most of the, us know that it's a recession proof, educational, but they are, they are more aspect to it, you know, at probably a better yield, a better IRR, if you can discuss about that, if any investors are looking from India or from, from Europe who want to invest in US PBS market. So, okay. Specifically on, on US PBS age, I, I don't study enough of, you know, what the yields are for, for other asset classes especially outside of multifamily that I, I feel qualified to even answer that question. Um, we compare PBS, PBSH and multifamily. Well, that really ends up becoming, you know, what markets you're looking at because most of the markets you're going to see new conventional that, you know, where, where the cap rate is high enough that it makes sense, you know, that it makes sense to come in and, and hold something, you know, somewhat short term. Yeah. That's very city driven and, I, like I said, I just don't know that I feel but qualified pick, to even answer that question. I'm going to pick one city, one region, and, and probably have an example on that, if you're comfortable. And uh, yeah, I mean, you could pick the city that I live closest to, which is which is Charlotte, North Carolina. And, it, you know, we've got a strong PBSH 
market here that is uh, very well represented by you know lots of different equity groups and operators that mostly support uh, the uh, University of North Carolina and Charlotte. <laughs> and then you've also got, you know, we're one of the, I think probably top five cities. You know, we've had a lot of migration from the Northeast of the U.S. into into this area, you know, since since COVID. And it has um, put a you know, big squeeze on, on housing. Developers, you know, cannot build fast enough going into 2021, 2022. As we're talking about this and I kind of think about what's happening also on the on the SFR, the single family rentals and the buy up that's happening there. Um, uh, you know, that's something that, you know, I know Vanguard and BlackRock and a lot of those guys are involved with, you know, in funds that are, are purchasing up a lot of those homes. Uh, you know, that would be something I think would be interesting and in, um, looking how that compares to you know, to the other asset classes, but yeah, I mean, you know, as far as, again, I'll just go back to, to Charlotte. Like right now we've got a little bit of an over overbuilt situation on the PBSH side. And I think we're probably going to see, you know, some constriction there, but man on the multifamily side right now in Charlotte, if you can find a deal and, and again, I'm talking mostly on the new development side of it or from a value add, cause there's a lot of areas in Charlotte that, you know, you're seeing this, um, gentrification of some areas and that type of thing. I think that's, you know, that's very interesting in some of the numbers I've looked at, um, at some of the local conferences that, you know, that I've paid attention to here. I think that's actually yield right now. I, I, again, I don't study enough to know, but I got to imagine based on some of the articles and things I've, I've read and listened to that it's, uh, I would rather put my money in that right now. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. Let me let me try to answer or probably add to your thoughts. So what I've been reading and I've been discussing that approximately it's 20 percent IRR, you know, over a five years in US versus if you go to a new markets, let's say Germany is sub 20. But if you go to Italy, where the provision rates are probably under 10 percent in Milan, Rome, you know, Italy, you know, there are some assets and some cities which have given 27, 28 percent IRR. IRR. Right. Oh, new development. Yeah, new development in okay. India. Yeah, if I compare with India, India is a very, very interesting inflection point. Wherein, so in 2015, you know, there were a couple of developers who acted like a PBSA in India. You know, they raised lots of money and tried to because it's still a comparatively new asset class in India. Right, and in India, real estate is a very different beast. Very, very different beast. Everyone wants to invest in real estate, and they've been making money. Right. Uh, but in spite of there is 40 million students in India and there's only eight to 10 million beds, that's the opportunity for overall community of student housing abroad in India. But the in last nine years, the market has seen a couple of corrections because of COVID and also still not lots of new greenfield investments are coming in. People are trying to change over brownfield due to which a typical experience of student housing in India is still lacking, right? I know there are few of the equity groups exploring India for a while, and there's a policy, people are keeping a watch on policy, keeping a, people are watching a keep of how India will become a study in India, Asia hub for international students, at least Asian students. But not a bad time to probably see India as seriously, because you know there is huge value. One can have an early more advantage, and someone have a 10 to 15 years or 7 to 10 years is time horizon. But coming back to you know, last uh, segment, I know you need to go. It's it's 1 a.m. in India. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to be awake and active. And of course, you know, whenever I get a chance to uh, talk to you, uh, learn and seek from you, I'm always up. So what are the biggest challenges now? You know, we talk about opportunities, but what are the biggest challenges uh, of PBSs in, in US and probably we want to touch in different markets? over to you specifically on operations anything operations recruitment leasing attracting international so, or yeah so bi biggest challenges is what you're asking yeah yeah i think if if we're looking long term you know beyond five years yeah let me let me come back to the development because i think there's like i said there, there's been a bit of a drought on the new de development side um two reasons 
obviously there's the kind of the shifting in enrollment that we're seeing and everybody's trying to figure out, okay, you know, we know what we consider the power five. Those are the, the American football big conferences, right? We know that those universities are solid and it's more of just replacing, you know, aging inventory, you know, that needs to be replaced. And then, you know, finding those little infill brownfield spaces the the opportunities there are either for someone local in those markets who are able to farm that you know they know about the little piece on the corner that no one ever really thinks about when they you know come in and canvas a, a market there's those type of developers um and the biggest issue that they're going to have is uh, all of the capital out there you know is going to require that there be an ex a, a pbsh experienced developer or partner that's involved and so it's very important for those developers to you know partner with the landmarks and the trinitas and some of these bigger developers in order to or experienced developers in order to to do that most of those folks don't want to take you know an lp position <laughs> they want to they want to come in and and um control that situation so and then you've got you know the bigger the bigger developers that have put so much time and work and research into those markets that you know they know what they're they're going after um and they and they're patient wait as long as they need to um in order to to acquire those sites <clears throat> um so you know the group that's kind of in the middle i don't know where their place fits into this if there is even a place so that's that's the next five years i think it becomes it becomes even more hard for that type of developer over the next um, over the next decade, um, from an operation standpoint, as I mentioned earlier, getting our hands around you know where we're headed with technology, I think is going to be it's going to be one of the biggest things that it's it's going to disrupt a lot of what we're doing, and there's going to be you know winners and losers in that. Um, who those winners and losers are going to be right now, I don't know. You know, is it on the startup side? Is it the smaller group that? you know, maybe a little bit more scrappy and, you know, can figure these things out, you know, just because of pure grit. Um, is it the larger companies that, you know, can can bring in the professionals and pay the money to to kind of get all of those things sorted out? I, you know, I don't know because I've seen <laughs> I've seen losers in both, you know, in both of those situations. <clears throat> it is going to be disruptive. Are you seeing a, a quick adoption of technology and especially AI? See a lot of wasted money. I see, I see people adopting things because they saw something really cool or they heard something, you know, they get into it and six months later, they're still not utilizing it to its fullest. So there, there's that. But the biggest thing, and, and this is going to be, this kind of ties, you know, back into the technology part of it, you know, staffing and manpower, human resources, it is incredibly hard to recruit to man these, these facilities these days. Oh, why so? Um, um, well, let's start on the maintenance side because I think that's the, you know, where the biggest need is. We've got a country that is, um, has done a horrible job of promoting the trades. That has put a, you know, a huge, most maintenance guys that would be qualified to, you know, manage a 500 bed building are typically going to be able to make way more money doing something else, you know, just quite honestly, owning their own business you know, focusing on what they, you know, the, the one part of whatever trade they're, you know, they're gifted in. Um, they're, yeah. There's just so many more possibilities, you know, for, for them to make money. And so, so that alone is, you know, part of the issue that we're dealing with. And then, you know, like I said, there's just a lot of open positions. And even if you do get it filled, you're constantly having to worry about backfilling it. So that's one thing where we, we are actually looking at some things that as far as bringing the industry together and providing some kind of a pipeline of, you know, students that are coming out of high school, maybe they don't want to go to, you know, college for whatever reason, and they want to, you know, they want to take, you know, something in, in the trades and, you know, I'd, I'd love to, there's some kid that, you know, wants to take, you know, something at a, at a community college level or at a trade school level and they're you know going to school full-time for that and they're working part-time and you know we can give them a place to live and 
teach them uh, about facility management, then I, you know, I think that's something that we've got to look at. So, and, and those are things that I'm, I'm talking with, with a lot of operators on kind of coming together on, man, <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> so many challenges. It, it all comes down to people at the end of the day, right? Not just putting, putting their butts in, in seats, but yeah, you know, making sure that they're learning how to how to lead others respectfully. You know, I think the operators here, most of them do a really great job of that. But it is it is something that just never ends. You you don't ever get to the end of it, right? It's something you've constantly got to be working on, um, especially in this industry, because you know, forty percent of your, maybe even higher than that, maybe sixty percent of the workforce is going to be age, you know, nineteen to twenty four. <laughs> And they're not going to be staying very long. They're, they see it as something that's a stepping stone at the most. But, you know, I, I would say for most of them, it's just, hey, I don't have to, I don't have to get in the car and drive to a restaurant to work or. I mean, I pity because you and me have made, or many of us have made killing out of being around. Yes. You need to be around for a decade, a decade and a half to, to, yeah. to do it and do it consistently. But yeah. it's, it, I'm all, my all heart for this industry, you know, whether it's US PBSA, global PBSA, I believe it's such a great inflection and amalgamation of you're dealing with students, parents, universities, all kind of people, investors, operators, all kind of people. And it's such a great learning curve, you know, not many industry, at least I'm biased. I'm very, very biased, you know, for this industry, because you get, you get to travel, you get to use your mind as well as your body. You know, it's a, yeah. it's a sitting desk. It's not a just a very academic theoretical uh, job. So, all all hearts for this uh, this industry, especially when you are catering to students, and that your experience and your response to students, their parents can make it or break it a family. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's a, it's a very inter- it's been a very interesting time over you know my period in this industry because I came in at a time where there was a substantial amount of growth. And most of the folks that, um, you know, are my age in this industry that have grown up with it, have the experience, we all went through things very, very quickly, you know, were promoted very, very quickly because, you know, I go back to, you know, the first developer that I worked for, or the second developer I, I worked for, I should say, you know, it was a small family owned business. They typically just did one or two projects a year and um made that switch from doing the kitty condo stuff to you know now building out apartments and a a for rent product which meant that they had to build out an operation side of their business and so that was kind of a perfect opportunity for me and you know literally coming straight out of college you know i was an assistant manager then i went into commercial real estate for a couple years and then i came back to this industry housing but specifically for this other developer that i mentioned and they were at kind of this inflection point of you know building out this operation side and so i i had the ability to come in to that property that they hired me on and put a lot of stuff in place that that they had not as far as policies and procedures and sops and things like that and um you know that paid off very well for for how that property performed the next year and so they were bringing on two more properties the next year and they needed somebody to step in and kind of be that regional manager. And that's what I did. And that should have never happened. I should have been at that property probably three years. Fortunately, they were very patient with me, loved working for them. So you, you saw a lot of folks that were my age that kind of came in and literally went from, you know, being a student worker to being a regional manager over, you know, the five, six property portfolio managing millions of dollars in real estate <laughs> and you know they'd barely spent you know an entire year on on site and so you know eventually especially after you know after the recession in 2008 and things kind of slowed down for a little bit um you started seeing a lot of folks you know their career path slowed down as well and they saw you know folks like myself get promoted very quickly and they're like well it took him three years to be a regional manager what you know, what's wrong with me? And it's like, it has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with the fact that there's just not that, probably there's not that growth that was probably happening. Been, probably been kind and humble to them, you know, it's, it's, everything is with you. You know, you're not improving, you're not working on yourself. You're not looking long term picture. Well, yeah, exactly. And, and, you know, I found myself 
explaining to a lot of them of like, look, you do not want to make the mistakes that I made, and I wouldn't have made the mistakes I've made if like like you know, like, I, like 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 uh, would love to learn from your mistakes. Yeah, yeah. It's just like, well, I'm thankful for all those, and I've got some of the battle scars to prove it. It's one of those things where you know it's it's not the best thing for the real estate by any stretch of the imagination. <laughs> and and um, you know we're, we're starting to see you know folks that are getting a little bit more satisfied to you know be at that property manager level. And um, and I tell folks like so many of these managers, especially you know ten years ago, you know they were becoming managers at 24, 25 years old you know, over these $40 million projects, you know, they wanted, they wanted to move on within two years max. And, you know, I started at that point in time, I was kind of, you know, getting to an age where, you know, I had enough kids at home that my priorities were changing. I'm like, look, go, go find those traveling positions and all that kind of stuff. But I'm telling you two to three cycles of it and you're done. Like you don't want to do it anymore. And just, you know, remember that you may want to very very much may want to just come back and you know be a property manager over you know a 500 bed property and market that you know really well and you're able to knock off at 5 30 in the afternoon and you know, a lot of a lot of folks that i came up with in that industry we have you know dinner or drinks at some point and they're like yeah, just give me 600 beds in Gainesville, Florida, and I'm good for the rest of my life. <laughs> like, so, anyway, I don't know that I, we, we, I went on a tangent there. I don't even know if I answered your question. <laughs> okay, again, it's not a question answer. It's, it's just a, you know, free flowing conversation between two friends. You know, you spent 27 years, you know, or almost three decades now. Any anecdotes, any unpleasant or present experiences you want to share? And then, and, 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 Rough of that dust. Now you've been, you know, you've been trying to be. I understand you running a consulting firm, right? You need to be a bit watchful. But you know, it, it's you. It's you know, you wear your heart on your sleeve. You know, so would love to hear some spicy juice. <laughs> yeah. No. I mean, I don't know if there's anything, you know, special. I mean, the the, the people. Years, Twenty-seven long years. There must be yeah. twenty-seven hundred stories to tell. Yeah, um, I, yeah, I have to think about that for a second. I mean, I think the, um, you know, what stands out in my mind the most over, you know, over my career, are just some of the folks that I've, I know this is kind of cliche, but, you know, a lot of the folks that, that I've worked with and relationships that were so thankful for, for those. It's uh, it's been nice to kind of get to a point in my career where you know I'm I'm seeing folks that you know at the site level you know I was trying to to help I, I hate saying trying to help mentor them that I don't feel like I've ever mentored anybody <laughs> but it's it's one of those things where you know you just you come alongside of you know certain people and you see their commitment level and they want to do well and you know you you attach yourself to that and just hold their hand through it. And um, it's been really awesome to see some of the folks that have come out on the other side of that. You know, I'll mention Jasmine Zlinko, um, who's, you know, she's leading up everything at Yugo here in the States. She was a manager overseeing, I don't remember how big the property was, but it was at a junior college outside of Chicago. Uh, you know, it was a P3 deal and man, I tried I tried promoting her so many times, but, you know, because of family situation and everything else, you know, she couldn't take that stuff on, but she wanted, you know, when there were opportunities for her to be a part of other, other things that she could do, you know, on a temporary basis or whatever, she always stepped up and I've always been, you know, I was always grateful for that. And it's just been, you know, it's been awesome to see, you know, see her career that that's one that's really you know, jumped out another one, Erica White. She's at um, Article Student Living, which used to be part of CA Ventures. But yeah, you know, she was a she was a CA at a property at ECU. <laughs> you know, and I, I will never remember or I won't ever forget. You know, teaching her. You know how much the the pizza party actually called a calls that property in value. You know, by attaching a cap rate, <laughs> and um, 
you know, just um, being able to see folks like that that have just been able to to excel and have done so well. Those are the things that stick out the most. Any any mentors, you know, which which probably you you been humble to call yourself my mentor, uh, but any mentors guidance which you will probably want to name or talk about. I, you know, and and this is uh, this was a little bit tough for me because we we lost him in 2019. But um, a guy that you know when I went when I jumped back into student housing, uh, Wes Bradley. He was he was leading the company at the time. He was the guy that had so much patience with me. And you know when we'd worked together throughout our careers, you know after that, because even when I went on to other companies, um, you know we were either managing his portfolio or you know, helping them sell properties or buy property or whatever. And so he was always a constant through, we lost, we lost him in April of 2019. And so that was tough. That was, okay. yeah, got a great relationship with my father, you know, losing him, um, losing Wesley was, it, it probably will feel the same, <laughs> same way at, at, you know, at some point in time when, you know, when my father goes on. So that is certainly one, you know, I think um, a couple of folks just aren't even in the industry, so I'm not even going to bring it up. But um, but that's that's really the the main one that I would point to for sure. I'm so sorry about that, but you know that's 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 life, you know. And I can see you are still very humble and grateful because when you spend 30 years going through those journeys and experiences yeah. and giving it a shout out to so many people, it's, it shows your character and it shows yeah. that collaborative and you know, grateful you are. Uh, on a on a on a lighter note and a more cheerful note, let's do a rapid fire round. I want I want to point out one other other one. The guy I spent about five years working under with Andrew Dark. Um, when was who this? Is, uh, is now over B Home and uh, and Timberline Investments, but. He was our CEO when I was at campus, when I was the COO at Campus Evolution. It was a, you know, he was this New York real estate guy. And I was this, this, uh, you know, Southern guy from, from the Carolinas. And so there were a lot of things that, you know, we, we butted heads on a lot, but um, there were so many lessons that, that he taught me. And it wasn't, wasn't necessarily something where he set me down and said, look, this is why, you know, why we're going to do this or why we're going to, you know, not do this. <laughs> It was, um, <laughs> unless if you've worked with a New York real estate guy, it's kind of hard to explain, <laughs> but it's just one of those things where you're learning on your feet and th there's parts of the business that, you know, I don't know that we all really appreciate that much, yeah. um, but he was able to, to really, you know, kind of, you know, show me a lot of the things that are under the hood that are, you know, really pushing you know things within within this industry so yeah it, it, i would say those that, two guys that, for sure that's why you have mentioned if it doesn't challenge you it doesn't change you it reminds you of him <laughs> that, that's a good one no i mean that that really reminds me of all the turn seasons that i've <laughs> had to work because I've, I've always told folks look if if this you're going to want to quit before this evening starts so because that summer turn process is it's it's brutal it requires so much planning and if if you get to the other side of it and you didn't think about quitting or you you know you didn't <laughs> think about crying um then you actually didn't go through it <laughs> so, brilliant, brilliant. So, so, so back to my rapid fire round we talked about you know we will talk about probably you know what all you've been doing under shh you know student housing site and also you are a, running a, a consulting firm called Provincial student housing, you know, mm -hmm. so you need to choose between SHS role and provincial student housing, which it gonna be, and you you can't play safe. It's a yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't. I don't know that I could pick, you know, between because it they've really kind of become synchronous, you know, between, you know, between each other. Um, you know, SHI kind of started out as a a marketing kind of thing, you know, for the consulting business. You know, it's it's Same. it's now. The two different coins of the same coin. It is. It really is. And, and I'm thankful that that I've been able to do it because most people, most people would not have. I don't want to say they wouldn't have figured it out. They wouldn't have done the things that needed to be done. And um, I feel like it's allowed me to have a bigger impact on the industry than ever thought I would have. So, 
टेक वर्स ह्यूमन टेक और ह्यूमन यू नीड टू चूज वन यू कैन चूज बोथ यू से टेक और ह्यूमन आई मीन I've got a soul. It's uh, it's always going to be human. <laughs> I'll, I'll always do. I thought you would be saying human who use technology, which you all have. Um, as far as being able being able to use it. Yeah. Um I look always I I I'm not a, I, you know, outside of work colleagues, I really don't have a lot of friends like, you know, that's just same, that's just same, me. Same here. Same here. Yeah, and um and I would say yeah, I mean they they are my friends, but you know, there's very very few that actually live close to me. And um I, you know, I'm a pretty uh I stand back, you know, quite a bit and don't make a lot of noise until I get in front of one of these microphones, but cause of that I put a lot of value on the on the few relationships I do have. I'm always on that side of that side of things if I can get it done with a human versus a versus a piece of technology. <laughs> which you know which in the which markets in US you know east coast west coast uh texas which market really excites you excites me from a standpoint of probably growth probably growth interesting uh you know things happening yeah let me don't let's don't talk about it from a standpoint of a of a particular market i mean there's markets i would you know if i was a manager that i would you know wouldn't work in but there are some tier 2 and tier 3 schools that have really taken it on the chin over the past you know 4 or 5 years from enrollment there are some folks that are that are coming out on the other end of that you know that are that are chancellors or presidents of the universities just to have this vision that is it's hard for me to even get my head around and they're executing on it and I'm excited about what that's going to mean for those markets because a lot of these markets are very small very tiny um name few rural name few um <laughs> I'm kind of hesitant to bring it up because I'm very, I'm very intimately involved on the consulting yeah, yeah. side. Yeah, it's okay, it's okay. Um, but but yeah, there there's a few of those markets that that you know I'm very bullish on you know because I know what's going on with the administration. You know things have not proven themselves out yet. We'll continue to see. I'll continue to work with them, and um, but I'm excited about what you know what their vision looks like and. um you know cuz there's so many other universities that are just kind of packing it up and you know they're talking about you know how their state system may just turn them into a satellite campus or something like that so um these other ones that are trying to blaze a trail those are pretty exciting great last 5 minute any question you want to ask to me uh, let me let me give you your main uh rule which you love <laughs> um well you know when i when i think about the conversations that we've had you know over the past couple of years i think you know the biggest thing is just um that i kind of wonder what it's like for you is overcoming you had yourself established in in those other markets and what has it been like to come to the to the US and try to you know try to tackle what we're doing here and introducing you know kind of a concept that is unknown and you know At, you know i've worked with a lot of 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 these marketplaces and you know there comes a point where you start seeing that dread in their face <laughs> like how am i going to tackle this there's always a smile on your face though uh i would i guess you know probably it's my dna probably you know i i like it hard way long way you know i mean it's not just, it's been 13 years right and and i've yeah. been trying to crack us when i was urologist co-founder you know that story you know yeah. from 11 2013 we started with uk and then i moved out i thought okay i will not challenge uk i started australia new markets absolute new markets and i spent lots of time in australia learning developing and all it didn't took the way it should have move had to move back to uk and along with australia added ireland you know i realized that okay if you are doing these three you know us is the biggest market entered us in 2018 19 uh, going well you know and pandemic happened you know then had no other option but to go back to our core uk or uk market because even australia got shut right so it, it has to be it was uk and ireland but last four years been very interesting you know team has expanded we have 400 people team we have used lots of technology lots of ai even web3 we have been using a lot so the 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 sheer magnum the market like us which got 20 million students and 1.1 international students and around 3 million bets 
only PBSA in US. And with all the learnings we had in different markets, we believe, you know, we we had to be be at it, you know. And now they, we have seen the inflection point, you know, wherein we've been, been part of conferences, we've been invited for speakers, you know. Uh, people are, uh, you know, seeing opportunities, and almost almost all the providers have tied up. You know, it it wasn't an easy journey, but definitely a very rewarding and very enriching journey. And it's just a start. It's just a start, right? So probably that's what keep me awake. You know, it's one forty a.m. in morning, and I don't think I'm less on energy. You know, <laughs> so probably you know anything which doesn't kills you make you stronger. So that is what challenging me. And uh, we're just getting started because it's an inflection point. If you see, very interesting last two years, wherein last two years been after COVID, last uh, uh, the next two years were very amazing, right? But if you see last year was the only year globally wherein we got election in 42 countries. There were there mm-hmm. are transition geopolitical aspect, you know, two wars happening, right? Mm-hmm. But the beauty of this industry, which I was I keep saying that this is the only industry which is recession proof inflation proof or at least inflation it it, it get factored in mm-hmm. pandemic proof and it's yeah. also world war 3 proof it should not happen but i can sure because no international universities can sustain without international students you know yeah. hence you know there will be lobbies there will be licensings there will be you know it will take care of itself and housing it's a need based product and i went through the journey you know, when I did get my housing, I stayed in a hotel. My my roommate, no, who's, who's my co-founder, he didn't get a very good experience when he went through. So probably rather than me choosing the industry, industry chose me. And if you're part of the industry and you're not crack US, then you have not been part of the industry. Yeah. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, like I said, I'm always, I'm always amazed at how, um, uh, you know, just your resilience and you're constantly, you know, thinking of, of other things. And like I said, just your positivity, I think is fantastic. So congrats to, to you and your team and looking forward to seeing more things happen. Absolutely. Very last question. What do you think? And let me read a question because I, my team shared eight, nine question. I have not asked any of out of it. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you think the future student housing looks like? Are there any specific areas or challenges uh, you believe the industry should prepare for the next decade? Well, I, I think I covered the challenges pretty, you know, earlier when we talked about, um, you know, specifically development versus operations and, you know, developments, just being able to pencil deals out and operations is, you know, really kind of figuring out what's happening from a human resource and a technology standpoint. You know, I think specifically here in the, in the U.S., you know, if you'd asked that question 18 months ago, I would probably say, you know, this enrollment cliff really concerns me and, and what's going to happen specifically at some of the tier two and tier three schools. And, and how do we, we've got to convert that real estate into something. And um, I think that that's still, that threat is still there, but there's, you know, there's some market, you know, like middle ten- Tennessee states really close to Nashville. There's been a couple of assets that have converted to traditional multifamily, but that's been easy for them to do because they're, you know, it's a Murfreesboro is a, is a uh, subsi- subsidiary, is a, um, you know, it's basically a, a bedroom community of Nashville. So a couple of companies come in and done a really nice job. I haven't toured those properties yet, but they've done a really nice job from everything I've, I've heard of, you know, converting a eight to 12 year old property into something that was purpose built for bedroom for bath into you know something that, that's working for conventional multifamily renters have, have, have you seen the uh, you know probably the pattern it is in uk and now in australia also and i believe europe also so they started with hmos or what do we call it, multifamily in uk and us in out here it's hmos house for multiple mm-hmm. from there a developer moved to a block from block to pbsa you know, and then the PBSA, PBSA sites are becoming a more commercial and more like you have, you have commercial uh, shops and showrooms in the first two floors. Then you have hotel or a co-living, and then you have you know next three, four, five floors as a student housing. Have you seen that kind of patterns in US? It, mm, 
Not exactly. Some in some of the, some in some of the metropolitan markets, you know, it's it's being discussed, it's being proposed. I won't get into the market, but it's a <laughs> it's a um, it's a market that is outside of a very large uh, southwestern city. The university has had they they've they've had some significant growth. They're uh, I think above forty thousand. There, there's been this flip that's happened between you know Chinese and Indian students, Indian students now. So there's that that we mentioned as far as finding affordable housing for them. But the other thing, as I was looking in that, as I was doing the market analysis for this client, there was also two years ago there was a very strong flip, and I don't see it going back. Where now there's more graduate students. Full, excuse me, full-time graduate students and part-time graduate students goes outside of, you know, your major research campuses, you don't, you don't see that. It's, um, and this one, even though it's got that Carnegie ranking for a major research university, it, it hasn't, I think it only gained that maybe three or four years ago. Um, and so, you know, what's causing, what has caused that flip has been more so, you know, from an economic standpoint than you know, them building out some new, you know, graduate research facility or anything like that. It's, it's been more so because the students that were there <clears throat> or the students that wanted to live, you know, in that part of the country, you know, it, it made more sense for them to go to school full time. And, and most markets like that, you just, you don't see it because, you know, the, it's typically, those graduate students are typically working somewhere full time and working on their degree part time their graduate degree part-time so that particular developer um the way that they put it wasn't you know here's going to be there is retail on the first floor but and i think there was even a couple of floors of parking that then went into a into another parking deck but you know they didn't go co-living versus you know pbsh it was they put their two bedroom units which are going to be primarily you know, targeted towards graduate students. They put those on the interior uh, of of this building because you've got a, you know, a open area in the middle where you've got a pool that's, you know, on the lower floor and that kind of thing. And so um, all the interior units were two bedrooms and all the exterior units were your four bedrooms where you typically put, you know, your um, undergrad students. And I said, look, and I told the architect, I said, look, I understand what you did here. Uh, you know, you're you're putting the quieter student in that inner corridor, so that you know when they're out on their balcony or whatever, they're not yelling at each other or you know throwing kegs over the, over the balcony or anything like that. But the what I would have suggested that they've done, of course, they were already too far along in this process. But put all the two bedrooms, you know, on the lower floors, like. Graduate students don't even want to get in the elevator with the undergrad students. So, you know, figure out a way to to separate them, you know, as, as much as possible. So I think there's, I don't, I don't know how much co-living is going to, I mean, there's definitely pockets of it that are becoming very popular. I think in California, just cause the, you know, the politics there just, you, you got to get creative because it's going to take there's such of a housing issue in in California, so I think I think that would work really well there. Um, <clears throat> certainly, you know, New York, Boston, Philadelphia, and in, in, in cities like that, I could see that working. You know, is that going to work in a uh, Austin, Texas? I, maybe I don't know. Um, I don't think it's going to work in a Tampa, Florida. It's not going to work in Orla in Orlando. It's not going to work in a Charlottesville, Virginia. So. I don't know. We'll we'll see. But yeah, I do like. Uh, I can't remember what's the uh, the operator now that that operates in the um, in Europe. But there's very much that you you know you go into you go into one of their buildings and it's amazing. You're seeing both ends of the spectrum. I mean, it's not retirement housing, but you're seeing somebody that has you know entered a, a part of their life where they still want to be around that university crowd. You know, maybe because the medical are schools are there. Let me chapter escape one of those. Stay no, I'm I'm drawing a complete blank on who it is right now. That it's not any of those. But anyway, yeah, you see this this co living happening between students and you know folks that are in their 60s, 70s, 80s. Yeah, 
<laughs> and you're not seeing that here in the in the states yet i don't know that i think you probably will in some of the you know metropolitan markets um but i don't know that you know we're not going to see that anytime soon in clemson south carolina right what is interesting about that market though is you are seeing a lot of retirement housing you know that's being built but they're not living with students nor do they want to <laughs> so. great great cool on that note you know let me first bottom my heart thanks to you for your time you know and ah, you're welcome to interact with you learn from you especially about u.s market Happy to share whatever little understanding we got for Europe and Australian markets. Uh, especially Asian markets is very, very interesting. I believe we should do something around India as a market because there's a huge potential. But yes, there's still five to seven years to make killing for it. But it's a good time to get in. Um, thank you for opening your heart, for giving your time. And I hope I have challenged you enough uh, to change a better version of you. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Anything you want to say, all yours. Otherwise, we can have uh, We'll see you in Vegas in a couple of days. See you on Monday. All right. Take care. Yes. Bye. Take care. Bye. See ya.